So the last few days I've been here in Prague, the, uh, the city of a thousand spires, and I've been in Prague to attend the International Christian Education Conference, uh, which is a conference uh, specifically for people working in international Christian schools uh, connected with uh, the Association of Christian Schools International. And so there were delegates here from uh, international Christian schools in a lot of different countries. Uh, I met people from New Zealand, from Nigeria, uh, from Hungary, from here in the Czech Republic, from Ukraine, uh, from, from a lot of different places. And uh, so there were 300 or so teachers gathered here uh, to think about uh, what faith has to do with, the, with the, their work in education. Uh, so I was presenting a number of different things at the conference this time, but because the conference was in Prague, it gave me an opportunity in particular for part of uh, one of my talks and the whole of another one uh, to zoom in uh, on someone who's quite a famous figure in this part of the world, and that's John Amos Comenius. Now, there's an awful lot that could be said about Comenius, but uh, for the sake of this uh, little segment, I'm just going to focus in on a couple of things he said in two of his major books. So in his great didactic, the Didactica Magna, he says, near the start of the book, it's indeed clear that humans are positioned among the visible creatures with the plan that they should be a rational creature, a creature which is the lord of creatures, and a creature which is the image and the joy of its creator. These three aspects are so united that at no time can any separation between them be admitted, for the basis of the present and the future life has its foundation in them. So uh, this, this strikes a theme that's repeatedly important for Comenius, which is that our ability to think, uh, the power that we have over the world, so the nature of our actions and the ethics that surround those actions, and our relationship with God are connected. And so intellectual development, moral development, and spiritual development have to be treated as part of the same process uh, in the context of education uh, and of schooling. Uh, for him, if you separated those three things out from each other, it no longer quite counted uh, as a proper education. Some years later, in another book of his called The Pampidea, he wrote this as his goal for the education process. He says, Firstly, the express wish is for full power of development into full humanity, not of one particular person, or a few, or even many, but of every single individual, young and old, rich and poor, noble and ignoble, men and women, in a word of every human being born on earth, with the ultimate aim of providing education to the entire human race, regardless of age, class, sex, and nationality. It's a paragraph that sounds like it should have been written much more recently, but one of the things that's, that's made Comenius uh, a, a famous son of his country uh, has been his, his early insistence on universal education and on providing education regardless of uh, differences in age, differences in income, differences in gender, uh, differences in ethnicity, uh, but this sense that because human beings are made in the image of God, that's enough. That's enough of a basis for them to uh, deserve educational opportunity and the kind of education that will help them to explore all, all of their capabilities as a human being and not just narrow down uh, to, to a narrow kind of training. Now, shortly after uh, expressing this, this desire for universal, well-rounded education for all human beings, uh, he says this. He says, I had this consideration in mind when I put the symbol of the art of the tree pruner in the frontispiece, showing gardeners. Now, it seems at first blush a very odd thing to say. So you're, he's, he's thinking about wanting to expand schooling to, to all kinds of, of children, uh, wanting universal, universal educational opportunity for everyone made in the image of God. Uh, he says in one place, there's no exemption from human education except for non-humans. So everyone's included. And then he says this was connected in his mind somehow with gardening. So how does he make this connection? Well, this is part of what I was talking about at the conference, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to try to lay out the whole picture here, but let me just mention one of the places where he's getting this idea of uh, schools and uh, equality of provision being connected to gardening from. Now, Comenius was a bishop, and he was a Bible translator. He knew his Bible well. And you find him mentioning gardens frequently in his writings on education, and there are also various signs that he's getting this idea of gardening, not just out of his experience of, of, of plants uh, outside the place where he lived, but from passages in Scripture. So an obvious place is the start of Genesis, uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, and he talks a lot about the Garden of Delight. He says we need new kinds of schools in imitation of the school of paradise, where God laid out all his creatures for, for human beings to look at. So he takes away from, from Genesis this idea that schools should be like a Garden of Delight, 
There should be places of beauty. There should be places where you get to see the full panoply of creation laid out. But he's also influenced by passages uh, later in the Old Testament, uh, such as passages in Isaiah. Uh, take Isaiah 58, for example, uh, where it says, If you do away with the yoke of oppression, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. And it goes on, The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Now that piece in the middle of that passage, you'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. It's one of those inspirational verses. In fact, I think I used to have it on a poster uh, decades ago. Uh, but it's in the context of a passage about doing away with oppression, about looking out for the hungry, looking out for the needs of the oppressed. Then you'll be like a well-watered garden. And there are various passages in the prophets where the garden image, the garden of delight image, becomes associated with justice, that uh, the community is like a garden of delight when there's space for everyone, when everyone has room to flourish, and when there aren't individuals who are being uh, left out from the provision of the community for their well-being. Now, Comenius takes these garden images and weaves them into the way that he thinks about schools. Uh, so schools like the original Garden of Delight should be places of beauty. Uh, he designed textbooks with elaborate pictures in them. Uh, he said he wanted to uh, make learning more pleasant uh, for his students. He wanted it to be a delightful process. Uh, but he also uh, was led by this, this, this imagery of the Garden of Delight as a place of justice, as a place of communal well-being. Uh, that seems to be one of the influences on him thinking about why educational provision needs to be for all kinds of students regardless of their abilities, their ethnicity, their gender, uh, because they're all made in the image of God. They're all called to be part of the, the Garden of Delight, but he says we've become horrible wildernesses, and so we need to be renewed. We need to be returned uh, to God's intention of us functioning as gardens of delight. And so he talks in different places about schools as gardens of delight, about learners as gardens of delight. He named a lot of his textbooks after, after gardens, and, and this becomes a recurring image for him. And this is one step along the, the long historical road, towards the rise of the later term kindergarten for talking about early childhood education, education as a, as a children's garden. So for Comenius, this idea of the school as a garden is a, as a place where there's a chance for everyone and where intellectual, spiritual and moral formation are intertwined with each other, all take place at the same time. Comenius was from Moravia, a little way from here, and, uh, but this part of the world, he's, uh, he's kind of a, a Czech national hero. And he was born in 1592, died in 1670, and so the Thirty Years' War overshadowed uh, a great deal of his life. But despite spending a lot of his life as a refugee, uh, he, he spent time in Poland and in Hungary uh, and in Prussia and in England uh, as part of a small persecuted Protestant denomination. He managed to do an enormous amount of writing across a lot of different topics. He wrote about language and philosophy and science, but mostly about education and books for schools. And what he's most remembered for is his pioneering work uh, as an educational thinker. Now, I've been reading about Comenius for a long time and speaking about him for a long time. I'll be posting uh, various papers uh, on the website, no doubt, uh, in time. But one of the delights of being at this conference was being able to speak about Comenius in his, his, his home region, in the place where he's most important, and to, to make sure that, that his voice was part of this, uh, this International Christian Education Conference here in Prague. And I also had the pleasure of being able to visit the Comenius Museum uh, down in the old town near the castle and came away among other things with uh, a Comenius mug with his likeness emblazed on, emblazoned on the side of it. So now when I drink my tea and I'm, I'm working on my research uh, back at Calvin College I'll be able to uh, drink with Comenius with me.